Good afternoon. My name is Midshipman First Class Ben Groons, and I have the pleasure of introducing the Honorable Robert Work today. The Honorable Work is a graduate from the Naval Reserve Officer Training Course at the University of Illinois and was commissioned into the Marine Corps as a second lieutenant. After a 27 year career and reaching the rank of Colonel, the Honorable Work retired and became a senior fellow and later Vice President for Strategic Studies at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments. Later, he served as the Under Secretary of the Navy from 2009 to 2013 in the first Obama administration. Responsible for over 500,000 active duty personnel, 200,000 government civilians, and a budget of $160 billion. In 2014, the Honorable Work became De Deputy Secretary of Defense overseeing the day-to-day -day operations of the Pentagon and developing the department's $600 billion defense budget. He is widely credited for his work with leaders in the department and intelligence community on the third offset strategy, which aimed to restore U.S. conventional overmatch over strategic rivals and adversaries. He served in that role until 2017. Secretary Work is now a senior counselor for defense and distinguished senior fellow for defense and national security at the Center for a New American Security, as well as the Chairman of the Board at the U.S. Naval Institute. We will now watch a video of Secretary Work having a discussion with Dr. Eric Schmidt about the roles critical thinking and artificial intelligence have in our military and the world. Following the video, Secretary Work will take questions from the audience. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, Bob Work. I'm the Chairman of the Board of the U.S. Naval Institute, and today I have the distinct honor of interviewing Dr. Eric Schmidt. Eric is an accomplished technologist, entrepreneur, and philanthropist. He served as Google's chief executive officer and chairman from 2001 to 2011, where he pioneered Google's transformation from a Silicon Valley startup to a global leader in technology. Under his leadership, Google dramatically scaled its infrastructure and diversified its product offerings while maintaining a strong culture of innovation, which carries on today. Now, he has done an awful lot of other activities since 2011. Uh, he was a member of NASA's National Space Council User Advisory Group for two years, which was chaired by the vice president. I was honored to serve with him. He and I were co-chairs of the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. And his most recent initiative, the Special Competitive Studies Project, was founded in October 21. It is a bipartisan, nonprofit initiative with a very clear mission to make recommendations to strengthen America's long-term competitiveness for a future where artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies are reshaping our national security, economy, and society. Eric, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Bob. I've had the privilege of working with you for 10 years. Yep. I first met you when you were DepSecDef, and let's just say you did really well starting with being a courageous Marine, and the rest is history. <laughs> thank you. Um, well, we're going to start off with some easy questions because I don't know if how many people in our audience realize how involved you are with the Pentagon and how involved you are with things in the Department of Defense. So I'd like you to tell the audience, how did you initially get involved with the Pentagon? What are the, some of the things that you are working on today to help the department? So Secretary Ash Carter, uh, who unfortunately died a couple of years ago, tragically, who was a mentor to you and to me, called me one day and said, you have to talk to me. And I said, like, why? And he said, I want to see you. And he visited me in, we were at a conference in Davos, and he visited me and he said, look, the, the, the Pentagon needs some new ideas, needs some new innovation. I want to create a, a group to provide advice to me and to the Pentagon. And I said, okay. And I said, how long do I have to do this? And he said, do it for a year, and then we'll hand it over to somebody else. So 10 years ago, <laughs> this was his prophecy. And of course, I became so enamored with both the mission of what we were trying to do and also the hard problems that 
I met you and I started working with you and the rest is history. Um, as a result of that work, I was the chairman of something called the Defense Innovation Board, which I did for roughly seven years. I worked for four different secretaries of defense, some of whom I liked more and some of whom I liked yes, less, which I guess is how it works. Um, but everyone was, was committed to reforming the way that the bureaucracy works. That's something you worked on very hard, Bob, in your service. I was also the chairman of the National Security Commission on AI as a, as a follow on that. And of course, you and I worked on that together. And I've more recently gotten interested in the question of autonomy and innovation. And I've sort of announced my opinion in an arrogant way that everyone's focused on hard power and soft power, but the real focus should be on innovation power. And that the next set of winners in national security and defense will be the ones who innovate ahead of everyone else. So that's sort of how I ended up here. Well, we've mentioned the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence uh, several times. And uh, from your perspective, now looking back, what were some of the takeaways as it relates to the Department of Defense? And uh, where do you think the recommendations of the commission stand today? Are they gaining traction? Well, all I can tell you is I'm, I'm a Silicon Valley businessman. And so everyone says that you and I had an enormous impact on the Pentagon and on the AI and the government. And I don't see it. But I guess relative to current expectations, they were so low. It's just really, really hard to change the way these systems work. And so you and your team had an interesting idea, which was, why don't we just write the laws and hand it to the lawmakers to pass them through the NDAA, which I thought was a su superb idea. And this is the benefit of having been in the Pentagon for so long. The Pentagon does follow the law. And so not only did we produce what was at the time, the definitive report on AI and national security and competition. But we also proposed the NDA changes. Roughly two thirds of them seems to have gone through. A lot of very important tactical ones. Some of the ones that are remaining are we really wanted to have a civilian core um, that would work with our military academies and others to bring in civilians into a training program for technical skills and especially AI skills. Uh, and also the way, does the way the government operates. We proposed in our report that there be a high-level steering committee at the White House under the vice president, and it, that hasn't quite happened. But aside from that, it, it really worked well. Now, after the commission was over, you were quoted as saying AI could be the military's new nuke, but only if the Pentagon acts like a tech firm. Right. What did you mean by that? And uh, what are some of the recommendations you would have for the Pentagon to act more like a tech firm? Well, uh, let's describe the way the military actually works. So first place, the senators and the House make sure that the money is distributed evenly across the country. That's fine. The second is that the services protect all of their uh, bureaucratic goals, political goals, financial goals, structural goals. As, as all bureaucracies do. So you have to find things that are consistent with the mission and that can be absorbed into the political culture that the military has. And the problem is that the design cycle is so, so slow that everything I'm saying now will be wrong by the time the Pentagon actually does it. So I'll give you an example. You and I tried to get an AI fund, uh, this is essentially a super, a, a larger version of Maven, through. And that money took two years in the POM process to discuss. And the POM process allocates two, to start money two years from now. And of course, the projects take two or three or four years to get built. So you're planning stuffing in AI that's seven or eight years from now when in fact, we're doing it right now in the commercial sector. So this, this gap is really, really a problem. So each of the services has created the equivalent of the Army Futures Command, AFWorks, and so forth in the various services, which are an attempt of getting rid of that, of that. Some of the services are also using alternate authorities, OTAs of one kind or another, 
to actually go get, get sidestep the procurement process. So I want to be blunt about how the procurement process things. There are three bidders. They take years to bid. They take two years to make the decision. They take another two years to sue each other. And then we start building something which is overpriced and out of date, right? This is not a very good way of fighting wars. And it also doesn't really solve the problems of our service people. And since this is the Navy, um, I, I always thought, you know, they're always interesting examples. Take a look at the littoral combat ship, LCS, or the Zumwalt, right? They're just, they were just bad ideas conceived by committees. And when I was a young executive, uh, I was told, you know, the, the old saying of, is, is that a camel is a horse designed by a committee. And the problem with the political process in the military and the government is that everyone throws everything into their thing. And so you end up with something which is not workable. And so this is how we end up in a situation where we kill a terrorist instead of with a bullet with a rocket that costs a million dollars. It's just, it's just the wrong model. And, and these are I'm not saying things that are not well understood within the military. Our military leaders don't have the ability to fix these things. They don't have the empower. And it bothers me just to finish my soapbox. We take these four, five, six, seven, whatever star generals they are. Uh, we train them to death. They're incredibly capable. And we don't let them do anything, right? We tell them, you know, you're not really in charge because you can't really control your weapons. You can't really control where things are deployed. We don't give them money to make their own local decisions. Everything, nobody trusts each other. I want us to trust our military leaders. I trust them a lot more than I trust our politicians and the tech industry, I might add. Thanks. You, know, uh, you always would say at the commission and now in the uh, the uh, SCSP, Special Competitive Studies Project, that this all revolves around people. Yeah. And if we were going to make uh, the Department of Defense more like a tech firm, what type of training would we have to provide our active duty military and our civilians uh, to make this thing work? For what I do, I think the truth is there's some amount of training, but frankly, there's an awful lot of just different people that need to get hired in. Um, I'll give you an example. I went to the Air Force Academy and I met with some of their tech people. These are undergraduates and graduate students, and they were brilliant, just totally brilliant. They, they are in the system. The problem with these totally brilliant people is that they, because the military believes in general management as opposed to specialized skills, they end up having to do lots of different jobs to get to the very tippy top, which everybody wants to be. That makes no sense. We should have specialized tracks like we have with doctors. So in the, in, in the form of innovation and technology, why don't we have a technologist track of people who just want to build incredibly interesting things? Right. And the military's problems are very interesting, right? As a matter of science and, and so forth. And make that part of the military culture. Instead, what happens is we have general officers who don't frankly understand the technology very well. And then you have primes who are busy organizing to do whatever the contracting rules say because they have to. And the actual innovators are either deep inside the primes or they've been um, essentially sub uh, they've been given to sub subcontractors where the real intelligence is right so so i and other tech leaders we go straight to the inventors and say is this thing going to work right uh, uh, it's an aside but I've, I've been trying to help work on ukraine and we're trying to figure out a way to make drones that never miss well I don't do that by asking you who then ask somebody else and so forth and so on. What I do is I find the engineer who has an idea and I have them tell me their idea and I tell them and I say, is it going to work? And what that conversation is almost illegal in the way the military operates. And yet it produces great products. Very interesting. Now, the broader theme of uh, this part of the conference is critical thinking. And uh, what critical thinking skills do you think will be necessary if artificial intelligence becomes the new nuke for both our military as well as our enemies? So the first comment about life is that you want to teach people to be analytical thinkers and be critical thinkers. And a simple rule in my world is if you can do calculus, 
you're probably capable of playing in these spaces because calculus is really about math and ambiguity, right? How do we solve this problem? Um, so one way to understand what's going to happen in AI is that AI systems will be teamed with people. And a simple rule for everybody in the audience is the goal of AI in the rest of our lives is to make each and every one of you twice as productive. So if you're a writer, you write as, twice as much. If you're a doctor, you treat twice as better, whatever. Um, if you're a musician, you make twice as better songs or more songs. Um, if you're a scientist, you make faster discoveries. If you're a programmer, you write better code, you write more code. If you're a lawyer, you sue more people, you know, whatever the joke is. The important thing is your productivity is increased by using these tools in conjunction with you. And most people in discussing AI are convinced that somehow AI robots are going to show up. Now, Bob, you are an actual expert on military robots, warfare, the science of drones, all this kind of stuff. You can talk about that. But the important thing is we're not building killer robots. What we're doing is we're trying to get our humans to be more effective at everything they do. That's the way to understand it. And so you need to have the skills to be able to work with these systems, which are imprecise. So for example, I do not want an AI doctor. I want a doctor who is using AI. I don't want to be in a. I don't want to be in an airplane without a pilot. I want the pilot to have AI helping the pilot, but I want the human there. That's how I think because my life is at stake, and I can't. I cannot accept risks. Now it's been said that you're on a mission to rewire the U.S. military with cutting edge AI to take on China in a long term um, strategic competition. Right. And in your opinion. How does the U.S. achieve and maintain a military technical advantage against competitors and adversaries when the changes in technology are happening so fast and in so many different disciplines? How does the U.S. achieve and maintain that advantage in such a dynamic competitive environment? Well, it's interesting that the, I've, I've always believed, and you and I have spoken about this at some length, that the fight between China and the U.S. will be the defining rivalry, not war, but rivalry for the rest of our lives. That is my opinion. Um, I used to be more scared of China, but China is now so large and has its own problems because the dictatorship, blah, 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 all the stuff you guys know, that I'm still worried about it, but I'm not quite as worried about it. I was there with Dr. Kissinger in July. You know, we're good friends and he's sort of a hero there. So I got a chance to talk to the government as well as the entrepreneurs, and they're having a lot of problems. They're having, um, for example, they're not having children anymore to speak of. Nobody's getting married. They're in deflation. Coming out of COVID, the zero COVID policies really hurt them. And when history is written, COVID will have COVID, which of course originated in China, will really have knocked them off for a while. They're going to continue to be world leaders in things like new energy, but it's not obvious to me that their overall productivity, their overall growth will exceed that of the United States. So that's good news. The Trump administration, followed by the Biden administration, did some really clever things. There's a technology that's built by a company called ASML. It's called Ultra EUV Technology, and it allows you to build particularly powerful chips. And the Trump administration, followed by Biden, put in regulations to prohibit the use of those chips and that technologies by China, as well as limit the export of powerful chips to China. That has set them back. That was a good example in the rivalry of withholding some technology that they were critically dependent on to slow them down. Good job. And <clears throat> that that's the kind of technique with a rival where you can slow them down to buy yourself more time to invent your future. Um, with respect to Taiwan and so forth, is you, this group spends all, all sorts of time talking about Taiwan and so forth. All I would tell you is, I really want to see an awful lot of underwater, water-based surface drones of one kind or another. Um, I'll give you an example. In Ukraine, there are three small companies that take boats and fit them with guns or bombs. And the first round, they put in a Starlink, and they basically put a whole bunch of dynamo and basically tried to get to the boat. Starlink was geofenced. They didn't make it. The Russians discovered it. Second time they did it, they put in a different communication system and they managed to get close enough to the boat that 
they but now the Russians had figured out what to do it. So they shot it down with machine guns and they used military helicopters in a way, Bob, that you would understand. So their new idea is to figure out a way to do to do remote drones that can shoot from a distance um, in a complicated way. My point is not to tell you their narrative, but it's interesting, but to say that that's the nature of the innovation. If you're going to build a new way of doing surface war, you be, need to be in the game. You need to be trying because your enemy gets a vote um, and all the simple assumptions can be can be a, can, can be challenged. What I would suggest, for example, for the Navy is build your build a little incubator and try a different set of combinations of these military uh, autonomous vehicles and find out what actually works reliably. I don't think we know yet. It's too new a question. You know, and, and, and Bob, you you are the author of the third offset and the whole notion of precision warfare. So there's a fourth offset, if you will. You and I wrote an article called Offset X which descri describes the, the architecture of these things. The military now needs to have the courage to try these things knowing that most of them won't work, right? Remember the core thing about innovation is most of my ideas are bad and most of my products don't work, but occasionally if I get them right, they blossom. You know, in this competition where, where the Chinese are trying to outthink us and we're trying to outthink the Chinese, uh, who do you think has the advantage uh in this over time structurally or the way we treat our people or the way we crit way we do critical thinking how would you kind of judge the two competitors i think it's important to remember that the westerners don't get china because we didn't grow up in their culture and so china is a is a different culture and a way of thinking about things and so one way to state it is we're going to have the Chinese culture fighting the U.S. culture. We all are familiar with the U.S. culture. It's crazy. It's democracy. It's loud. It's messy and so forth. It's produced an extraordinary country, right? We're all patriots. I love America. What's the equivalent narrative for China? More consensus-based, but fundamentally also rigorous, thoughtful, and strategic. So the thing that we don't appreciate about China is that they don't do anything randomly, right? In America, it seems like every day there's something crazy happening, right? It's what we watch on the news. We enjoy it. In China, it's a different methodology of planning. And so in the long-term competition, you have to assume that they figured out their weaknesses, of which the number one is their reliance on the dollar, which we never talk about. But... I mean, if we shut down the dollarization of China, it would destroy them right now, right? And th there's no obvious way to solve that. So they, I, I, my joke is there must be a thousand people in some building in Beijing that I've never met to spend all day talking about how to solve this problem. So you can be sure that culturally they understand exactly their long-term weaknesses because they're very long-term thinkers and that they're working on them. We have to make sure we have a similar long-term process in America. Having said that, the 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 current outlook is America is the inventor and China is the volume player. That has been true for a long time. Whether that will continue is not as obvious to me. Their labor costs have gone way up. Their real estate is a disaster. Um, their product there, there are all sorts of productivity problems. And in fact, China is now racing to build industrial robots to deal with their loss of population. So. I would argue, for example, in, in America, since everyone wants to come to America, we need to be more open to high skills immigration because we can overcome our population shortfall by being a magnet for the top minds in the world. And by the way, they all want to come to America. Why? Because we're the luckiest people around. I think you've given all of the midshipmen in the audience a lot to think about. How should they prepare or how would you recommend that they prepare to lead in a world? that's shaped by artificial intelligence and these other critical emerging technologies? I can give some general advice, um, I, as you are. I'm just a huge fan of, of this group and what everybody's doing. And I love the I love the patriotism and the sense of service because I think that's a defining aspect of one's life. I'm happy to be able to serve now. I didn't have this when I was your age. Um, the, mo the single most important thing is going 
to do is to remain current yourself on what's happening with technology trends. So that means having the latest computer, the latest phone, and be an expert on the latest apps. Even if you don't like TikTok, since TikTok is the number one app in the United States and it happens to be owned by a Chinese company, I would be an expert on that. I would know everything about it. Uh, and you sit there and said, that's the stupidest thing ever. I don't really like TikTok or I love TikTok. Why is he telling me to spend time on it? Because you need to understand what it can be used for. So TikTok, so I'll give you an example. Can TikTok be used to survey people? Figure that out. I'm just using these as examples. I'm not making an accusation. I don't know. But but what I found is the technology changes so quickly that you you have to have a you have to have your own intuition, right? And and the great thing about this technology is most of it you yourself can interact with. Talking about interacting with AI, there's been a lot of talk about generative AI, and uh, many people are worried about it and saying, you know, this is not something we want to pursue. It's dangerous. It could lead to all sorts of problems. How do you answer those concerns? I'm so glad we didn't have social media when telephones were invented by Alexander Graham Bell. Did you know that telephones are being used by criminals today and we should ban them? <laughs> and I'm so glad these people weren't around when cars were invented. Did you know that it's crazy to have humans driving a car? They're incapable of safely driving a two-ton vehicle and not hitting the horses. Right. And remember, indeed, there were these concerns, but thank God we still have cars and telephones. So generative AI is here to stay. Um, and, and let me give you some examples of what it'll be able to do. Um, I had to write a memo to the president. So it would happen to be on AI. So I wrote my memo and I sent it to, in this case, GPT-4. And I said, rewrite it. Don't change the math. <laughs> OK, because it isn't very, it isn't as good on math as I am but it writes much better than I did. And I sent that to the president. That's a big deal for Eric, because I don't think I'm a very good writer. And I came across, you know, it was such a good memo, they liked it. And I was proud of myself. I, I know that's trivial, but it's an example of the power of this stuff. There's plenty of issues. They hallucinate, they get confused, they can be used to generate misinformation. But a system which can generate new content at the biological level, the physics level, the language level, the entertainment level is a very big deal. Um, and it's going to threaten all sorts of economics, but it's also going to generate a whole bunch of new economics. I think we've covered an awful lot, but is there anything I didn't ask you that you think I should have? Or is there something that you would like to, you know, that you think we didn't cover that's important? I think the most important thing to say to, to everyone in the audience is that the future is largely going to be quite different from what you're being taught now because of the evolution of autonomy, robotics, and AI. And I'm going to use a really simple formulation of, of national, national conflict. Um, you have armies on both sides from 100 years ago, and whichever one can withstand the the pain of the other better ends up winning, right, in some form. And so it's ultimately, and we all understand this is why this is such a, a courageous thing that you all are doing, it involves real risk to you. Autonomy allows you to sit in the safety of your remote command center and do what you need to do remotely. And it also allows you to do it in a much more precise way. Bob, you are literally the world's expert on precision. <laughs> right. So imagine a world where everything you do is surgically precise. That's what's going to happen. Um, I'm part of a team that's trying to do this in Ukraine. And what we're trying to do is to use AI techniques to make sure that, that the targets are hit. They don't have any collateral damage. And it's highly efficient with respect to loss of life uh, in a good sense. A, a small number of people harmed and achieve the military objective. Uh, that's the future. So this notion of thousands of people on the beaches of Normandy, as much courage as that was, and, and I, for one, cannot imagine as a human being doing that. That's how impressive that is. That's not going to happen again. We're going to be using very sophisticated weapons from remote places 
under sea, on the sea, above the sea, whatever, um, to achieve our objectives. We're going to do it with much fewer, much less loss of life and much more effect. And um, I think, Bob, I want to give you some credit. You did a lot of this work in your career, and I'm hoping to help advance it a little bit uh, with you in our new project. Well, thank you for your kind words. I think they're far too kind. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> I just want everyone in the audience to uh, know how much you have influenced the Department of Defense's way of thinking and how much you have contributed to new uh, new initiatives and things that are going to make our military stronger, uh, safer, uh, and able to perform missions that they have never been able to perform again. And so you're kind of an unsung hero in the background. Thank you. Uh, and I think we are done. Uh, I don't have any other questions for you. Thank, thank you all. It's a really a pleasure to serve you all and to serve our country. And in my small way, I hope I can make a difference. And I encourage you to feel the same way. Thank you very much. And I just want to end by saying we really appreciate you taking your time out of your busy schedule. You know, it's that you're, you're in Ukraine a lot. You come back, you go to Asia, you come back, uh, you go to Europe, you come back. You're on the road all the time. Thank you for all the work you do to shape our national security, economy, and society. And uh, can't wait to see you in person. Okay, I'll see you soon. Yeah. Thanks, thanks right. everybody. Goodbye. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Midshipmen, guests, uh, members of the Institute, and friends of the Institute. It's a really great pleasure to be here today. Um, Eric really wanted to be here. I've been working with him for several years, as he said, and I really do believe he is a true asset to our department. Um, and as I said, he really wanted to be here today, but he's overseas, as he always is. I think he's in Hong Kong. Uh, maybe he's in Taiwan. I don't, I don't know. But he asked me to send his regards to all of you and to thank you for considering this very important topic, critical thinking. Before I answer uh, uh, questions, and man, I'm really nervous that Eric isn't here because the way we normally split it up is I'll talk about doctrine and con ops and uh, the Department of Defense, and he takes all of the technical questions. Uh, so, you know, I'm incapable of answering the technical questions to the uh, detail that he can, uh, but I'll try. I just wanted to say when I became the Secretary, Deputy Secretary of Defense, you know, I knew that I wanted to concentrate on the military technical competition. As the Undersecretary of the Navy, I saw what was happening in the Western Pacific. I was extremely concerned that we were losing our technological edge. Uh, so I was committed when I became the Deputy Secretary to really focus on that. Uh, so I gathered in a whole bunch of experts. Uh, you know, I'd call in the quantum guys. And they'd come into my office and I'd say, hey, what do you, what do you think is the most important technology the Department of Defense has to really dominate. They said, sir, if we do not dominate in quantum, the Republic is doomed. You know, we will lose the fight with the uh, uh, People's Republic of China. And I said, hmm, okay. Then I went home and broke out the tequila. Uh, so I came back the next day, and it was the synthetic biology dudes. And if you want to, re you want to talk with some really scary guys, you know, you say, what do you guys think? <laughs> If we don't get this synthetic biology right, not only is the department doomed, but the human race is doomed. So I said, well, I drank all the tequila last night, so I said, I'm gonna have to go to whiskey. Um, so I went to the Defense Science Board, a bunch of gray beards, people working with the Department of Defense their whole entire lives, extremely competent technologists. And I said, look, you have to help me make sense of this. You know. We have to prioritize. What is the technology we have to dominate in? And they went and they talked among themselves. They came back and they said, look, in our view, it's not even close. The Department of Defense must dominate in one area, and that is autonomy. 
Now, if you read their Defense Science Board summer study, a lot of people think it was about AI. It wasn't. It was about autonomy. Now, to get better autonomy, you need better AI. So you need to focus on the technology of AI to get to what you want to gain a military technical advantage, and that is autonomy. Um, and so that's what we worked on. And the way the Defense Science Board conceived it is they said, okay, there's going to be technology, excuse me, autonomy at rest, which is going to be all sorts of predictive uh, software. They're going to help commanders make new courses of action, predictive maintenance, back office, predictive logistics, all of that. And then there's going to be autonomy in motion. And that's going to run the gamut on all of the robotics and all of the different unmanned systems that we're going to see in every single domain. So we started thinking of it in that way, and we started seeding projects throughout the Department of Defense. And today, I mean, there's just so many of them. Uh, the Army is now talking about integrated manned, unmanned uh, brigade combat teams in which the leading element, the element that collides with the enemy, will be robotic, all robotic. Um, the Navy is working on the large unmanned surface vessel, the medium unmanned surface vessel, the large diameter unmanned underwater vessel, lots of different, the uh, X, I can't remember, but it's the unmanned uh, tanker flying off the carrier. The Air Force has the collaborative combat aircraft that uh, Pete Singer talked about, which is going to operate with manned aircraft uh, to provide an advantage in combat. So uh, I will be happy to try to answer any questions that you have on the way the department is pursuing this problem and autonomy in all of its different manifestations. And as I said, I just would ask you to be gentle on me on the technical aspects. Um, but with that, I would like your questions. And Ben, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, it's just Bob work or Mr. Work. You know, uh, when I became the deputy secretary, I came home and I did something. My wife said, you butthead. And I said, that is the honorable butthead to you. <laughs> I got away with that one time. <laughs> so, you know, it's just Bob or Mr. You know, you don't have to uh, refer to me as the honorable work. Yes, sir. Going off the last few comments by Dr. Schmidt, and in light of the recent events in Israel and the Middle East, is can the current use of artificial intelligence offer the Israeli military a way to achieve their goal of eliminating Hamas without killing civilians? I think that's a bridge too far now. Um, you know, AI is going to be used for precision targeting, uh, autonomous guidance systems are going to allow near zero miss accuracy, uh, and they'll pick the right weapon against the target to try to eliminate uh, collateral damage and uh, the deaths of innocent people. But, uh, you know, when you get into an urban conflict like that, uh, the AI isn't to the point yet where we'd be able to reliably identify combatants and non-combatants in the urban rubble and stuff like that. We're working on it hard, uh, but we're not there yet. Um, we will continually get better though. Uh, in ASW, I mean, AI is going to help acoustic superiority. It's going to be able to find a target uh, in the noise better than any human operator ever could. Um, it's gonna be the same thing in radar operators uh, essentially, all of the sensors are going to be much, much better. So the sensing side is going to get really good. And that's what the first part of Ukraine told us. What will combat be like on a battlefield in which the battlefield is almost but not completely transparent and it is swept by long, medium, and short-range guided conventional munitions with near-zero miss? and you have to operate differently. You have to spread out, you have to become smaller. Um, not to, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you're never gonna be stealthy. That's not the point. 
You want to make yourself less attractive as a target and harder to target so that you can operate inside the enemy's targeting cycle. And uh, you see that now in uh, Ukraine. Now they've shifted to a more conventional phase. But I'm telling you, if you fire, you know, uh, towed artillery, uh, the uh, Ukrainians are turning away from it. And they're saying it's got to at least be wheeled or tracked. Because once you fire, you're going to get fired on. And if you get fired on, you're most likely going to be killed. So um, everyone's trying to figure out, okay, what does this mean? There's a wandering answer to your good question. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yes. Mr. Secretary, um, you and I talked briefly about this on the Robbie Harris show, as I call it. But um, you know, we've got two examples of rapid military arms races that really uh, got uh, catastrophic. Naval arms race, World War I, which led to the naval arms treaties right after <laughs> World War I. Uh, then you had the nuclear arms race, which got very destabilized. We almost blew up the world, and Ronald Reagan finally got that under control. Hearing Eric Schmidt talk, it sounds like this is competition, but could you mention where might be the role for arms control with AI before we have a lot of bad history to live and then write about? Yeah, thanks, Mark. This is a good question. You know, a lot of people worry about killer robots. That is not the threat. The threat are autonomous control systems that can autonomously order either a preemptive or a retaliatory strike. Those are extremely destabilizing and, in my view, should be the focus of AI arms control. Uh, the, the killer robot thing to me is a, uh, it's just not worth trying to say, hey, we can't have a robot out on the battlefield. Um, I can't imagine how that would be uh, uh, how we would be able to make that work. But I think both the Russians and the Chinese might be able to be convinced, you know, having autonomous, preemptive and retaliatory control systems, especially for nuclear weapons, is not something we want to pursue. How could we agree and how could we convince ourselves that all of us are following the rules? Thank you. Yes. Sir, Mr. Third Class Frazier. It was mentioned that not enough leaders or not enough trust was put in our top leadership in the Pentagon. How can we balance oversight with giving our leaders the room to make decisions? Um, <laughs> uh, that's why I wish Eric was here so he could explain his, you know, uh, rebellious remarks. Um, I will say though. When we were talking about autonomy, we were talking about autonomy within the context of a command and control system in which we were pushing decision making to the very, very, very lowest part of the organization and to the edge of the battle network. We had a hypothesis. We thought that young men and women who grew up in a democracy where their ideas were actually welcomed and they were capable of independent will and making decisions when they didn't have communications with hire would outperform a system in which everyone grew up in a totalitarian regime in which their individual desires and opinions uh, were not only didn't matter, but they weren't welcome. So, we know that the Chinese theory of victory is system destruction warfare. They're going to come after every single link that we have in our battle networks, and they're going to try to blow them to pieces. And so there will be many, many times in the battle network in which units will not have any uh, communications with hire. Autonomous systems will allow us to fight through those type of attacks. You know, as long as we give the proper direction to the autonomous systems and say, if you lose communications, you are authorized to do these things. Um, so, as I said, this was all about a better command and control system in which we relied upon our people um, to operate faster. You heard General Mattis when he was talking about, you know, uh, a faster decision cycle. 
That was the whole thinking behind behind that. Yeah. I was on Guam as the deputy secretary. We were going to get, I just visited Guam, getting ready to fly back home. We're headed down to Anderson Field to get on my plane. And off there on the tarmac are two B-2 bombers. And there are a whole bunch of airmen on the B-2s. And you could see they were doing maintenance and uh, what they had to do to keep the B-2 uh, ser serviced. So I told my uh, staff, I said, hey, let's stop by and say hello to the airmen and thank them for what they're doing. So we go down there, and there is a, you know, an orange line around the bombers. And Airman Taylor is on duty. You know, he's, he's all strapped up. He looks great. I come in and say, hey, Airman Taylor, I'm the Deputy Secretary of Defense. I'd just like to go in and say hello to the airman. Sorry, sir, you're not on my access list. I can't let you in. My, uh, <laughs> my senior military assistant was Eric Smith, who's now the Commandant of the Marine Corps. And... Uh, you know, he started to Twitter because he was a Marine. And he said, uh, Airman Taylor, this is the number two civilian in the Department of Defense. And he said, sir, I accept that. But if he was number one, he wasn't getting through. I mean, I, <laughs> if I could have, I would have spot promoted that young man right there. Because I guarantee you, there isn't anybody in the Chinese Navy that's going to say that to, the, uh, to President Xi or somebody else. And that's our secret weapon, it's our people. So as Eric said, our job is to help our, our, uh, our artificial intelligence improve the critical thinking and critical decision-making skills of every single man and woman in the battle network. And if we can do that, we will beat anybody at any time. So we just have to say, how do we train our people. If all they're going to do is listen to what the AI says, then we don't want them as a leader. You know, critical thinking is all about skepticism and asking. That's what GPT-3 and 4 are all about. You have to be skeptical of what it's telling you, and you have to query it in a different way to find out if what it's telling you is true or if it's false. So, as I said, uh, I may worry about the technical aspects of the competition. In fact, I am worried about it. The Chinese are the most uh, difficult competitor the U.S. will ever face, primarily because they can match us step for step in technology. Um, but as far as people go, you know, that is where you know people ask me, "How do you sleep?" I said, "I sleep like a baby. I wake up crying every two hours," and so. But I always go back to sleep because of the incredible people that we have. Yes, ma'am. Sir, Midshipman Third Class Casper, um, you talked a lot about the use of, of AI and also the civilian sector. We've seen that um, military is using AI in the Israel and Palestine conf um, conflict already. How would you say that the military should approach its own use of AI when we encounter our own adversaries in terms of how civilians are going to react? You know, this was this is really important because our citizens, generally, if you go to China, I now I haven't been to China to talk about AI, but I've talked with Eric and all of the other technologists go to China, and China has a very optimistic view of AI. They think AI is going to improve their lives, allow them to lead longer lives, and to allow them to have lives that are more fulfilling. So it's a very optimistic AI, and they're generally okay with it. I mean, literally, I don't know. You go to a public restroom in China, and you get scan, a facial scan, and it will give you a precise number of toilet tissues that you can use. You don't get you don't get any more. You don't get any less. You better be in that damn database, or you're shit out of luck. <laughs> um, so you know they they allow that all the time. I mean they're comfortable with it. But if you talk to an American audience, I think because of all of our television and our movies and our science fiction books, generally Americans are less trustworthy of AI. So we have to spend a lot of our time making sure that we can convince our citizens 
we can use AI safely, reliably, um, and preserve your privacy and preserve, uh, you know, and operate within the boundaries of the law, our moral code, our legal code. code. And uh, we've got a lot of work to do here because there still is a lot of mistrust. Yes, sir. Sir, Lieutenant Commander Machado, I'm a requirements officer at OPNAV and 952 Mine Warfare. Um, two things. One comment, I think Mine Countermeasures is probably the, one of the best plays to use AI and autonomy. I totally it's agree. It's very time consuming, very difficult to do. And, you know, we're trying to do everything we can to leverage these tools <laughs> so we can get after that mission set. Um, however, I've now been at the Pentagon for about a year and a half as a requirements officer, and I, you know, I'm, I'm at a place where I, everything that Eric talked about earlier, right, I see it. Um, and we hear it. Everybody seems to know, there's no secret, right? The process doesn't work. There was the PPBE mid-year review report that was just released. We have a disruptive cap capabilities office that was just stood up by SECNAV. We've got DIU, or sorry, DIU. yeah, DIU, Defense Innovation Unit. Um, and then we have the acquisition process, we have JSIDs, we have requirements, all that, right? Where can somebody who's in the system, right, a peg in this weird circle, where can, where is there the most leverage to actually impact something so that we can get problems taken care of left. Everybody else recognizes that it's too slow to deal with our threats. So what, what can we actually do, me and my classmates and these future mids who are gonna be officers someday, what can we do to actually impact that change? Well, you've, you've just triggered my PTSD. Uh, um, well, one of the things is uh, Deputy Secretary Hicks just announced the replicator program. And this, in my view, has the chance to really shake things up. So I think you've probably all heard about this. She says, look, our customers are the COCOMs. They have pressing operational problems. Nobody knows the operational problems better than the COCOMs themselves. What we need to do is come up with con ops, concepts of operation, um, and then start buying all sorts of unmanned systems in every domain and we want to have thousands of them in 18 to 24 months. You're not going to do that in the way, you know, we typically do business. Um, DIU will become the engine room of Replicator. There will be an innovation working group that meets every month, meets with all the companies out there, and they say, hey, we have this unmanned surface vessel that we can put, you know, that uh, can really help the Navy. Their job will be... Can it perform as promised? And two, can it go to scale in 18 to 24 months? If they make the determination on those two questions, yes and yes, then it goes to an innovation steering group, which are all of the vice chiefs, and they will say, yes, this is consistent with what we're trying to do in the joint warfighting concept. And then they make recommendations to the deputy secretary that we should shift money uh, to procure these capabilities. So just by setting a requirement, we want to have thousands of unmanned systems in every operating domain in 18 to 24 months. It has the potential to really shake things up. Will it? I don't know. I mean, I wish uh, Secretary Hicks the best of luck. Um, and I think the building ought to be saying, what can we do to make this vision a reality? I think I'm getting the hook. Um, Yes, I am getting that. You got a short, you got a short one. It's, it could maybe be short. I'll, I'll try and make it short. So, sir, thank you for being here. Um, so for 50 years, economists and political scientists have been developing a deterrence framework that is based in pure rationality, um, derived from game theory. But in Paul Shari's book, he explains how AI is creating strategies for games with incomplete information like poker that do not involve rational steps, um, that involve steps that game theory would consider deeply irrational. 
What is the department doing to adjust deterrence theory to account for irrational strategies that resulted rational winning outcomes um, created by AI, but that would be unimaginable to people? Very good question. Um, the Office of Net Assessment is thinking about this. The Joint Staff is thinking about this. We've got Stratcom thinking about it. And right now, we don't have a theory of the case yet. We, we simply have not uh, developed a compelling theory of the case. We all know we have to. Uh, and so um, the only thing I can tell you is people are highly motivated to get this right. So we can start talking to the Russians and the Chinese and avoid a future where none of us want. Again, thank you all. You know, you're all on the front lines of uh, one of the greatest competitions that the world has ever, has ever seen or will ever see. So to all the midshipmen, congratulations. I wish you the best of luck in your upcoming, uh, upcoming career. And for all of you retired midshipmen out there, uh, thank you for your service to your country. God bless you all. So for, uh, we've called him the honorable work. We've called him Bob work. We've called him Dep Sec Def. I call him chair of our board. And I want to thank uh, the, our chair, uh, for his leadership and give him a book, which really doesn't cover it because he came out today when he really should have stayed home and uh, taken some taken some Tylenol. So thank you very much. Appreciate it so much. Sir. Thank you. Okay, well, this uh, we're coming to the end of our program. I'd just like to thank uh, our audience for staying with us. I think we've had a terrific day. I thank our partners at the U.S. Naval Academy, um, the Dean, Andrew Ledford, who we worked with as a partner in developing this program. It's been terrific. I also want to acknowledge the fact that the William Wood Foundation sponsored this event and helped us put it on. We couldn't do it without that support. And I also just want to say, I normally don't do this, but I would like to thank our three-person team that does 18 conferences a year, April Perico, Don Braun, and Amy Starkey, for all the work that they've done, because this is the last conference that I'll do as the CEO and publisher, and I'm in awe of their hard work. Let's give everyone, including our speakers, a hand. Thank you very much.